My talk today is going to be based on uh, some research I've been doing with Kristen Forbes at MIT. Oops. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and Kristen Forbes at MIT and Chris Collins, who used to work uh, with me at Peterson, and he's now at Morgan Stanley. Uh, we posted uh, an article on voxeu.org, uh, which you can see here, which is I got most of these ideas, but this is based on um, uh, research we did in the working paper there at the bottom, Forbes, Kenyon, and Collins. Um, and I'm also going to draw on uh, an earlier paper I, I wrote with Chris that you can also see there. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, so we know that um, you know, many central banks, governments, agencies, and private forecasters use the Phillips curve to model inflation and to help forecast inflation. So I thought it'd be useful to take us back to the original Phillips curve. Uh, and this was back uh, from his 1958 article, although it was based on data even earlier from the, the gold standard period, a period in which average inflation was very low. And what's striking about this uh, curve is how non-linear it is. Uh, with a low unemployment, the curve is nearly vertical. With high unemployment, the curve is nearly horizontal. It's, quite, it's basically hyperbola. It's extremely nonlinear, but most models that are in use today are linear. Uh, so Chris and I, in that first working paper, uh, decided to look at the US and see whether there was evidence for a nonlinear curve going back. And what we found is that when inflation was low back in the 50s and 60s, we found a nonlinear curve. But then as inflation rose in the 70s and the 80s, high in the 70s and 80s, we found a linear curve. And then since about the mid 90s, when inflation's back to being very low, we get a nonlinear curve. Uh, so um, then we, we argue that low inflation actually bends the curve and makes it nonlinear. So next slide, please. So uh, we believe that the reason for this is downward wage and price rigidity. Um, and uh, there is sort of lots of evidence for this in, in many countries, uh, especially when it comes to wages. Uh, but I would argue that it, it's also true somewhat but for at least some prices. Uh, you know, my barber has never cut the price of a haircut in my entire life. I've never seen that happen. And I'm sure there are other services like that where that's true. Uh, and also, you know, even in, in other areas like uh, goods production, you know, a wage rigidity probably has some effect on price rigidity. Um, we have a model here that's based on wages. Uh, and the key insight that matters is the is that uh, not all workers get the same wage increase and not all goods have the same price increase. So when inflation averages 10%, as you see in the green line at the top, the dotted green line at the top, some workers are getting more than 10% wage increases. Some workers are getting less than 10% wage increases. The average is 10. Uh, and when uh, that's the case, the curve is, is, is nice and linear. But as this expected inflation environment falls down towards zero, you get more and more workers uh, and firms you know, facing potential negative uh, price changes, which they resist strongly. Uh, you, know, it's, you just see this in the data. There's a huge truncation at zero. People really don't like wage cuts and they'd rather be unemployed or they at least uh, act that way. Uh, this basically bends the curve, uh, as you can see, to being flatter for higher rates of unemployment. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, we think that since we've moved to low, very low uh, inflation around the advanced economies, we've often been to the right here where the Phillips curve is flat and people have noticed that in, in, in research. And it makes it hard to estimate what the natural rate really is because changes in unemployment have very little effect on inflation. So I think this is um, going to be a topic of my next paper is, is what, what that means for macroeconomics. Um, but uh, next slide, please. Uh, what uh, Kristen and Chris and I did was apply this uh, to 31 other countries, mostly advanced economies. Uh, and we also got the same results that we got for the US, that when inflation is low uh, and for us, it's, it's when lagged inflation is, is less than about 3%. We find a nonlinear curve that you see on the left, uh, where high rates of slack uh, have very little effect on inflation. But when inflation is high, which is the panel on the right, when it's uh, lagged inflation has been above 
then you get a standard uh, linear Phillips curve in which slack does put downward pressure on inflation. Uh, these results are not sensitive to uh, reasonable changes in that threshold, whether it be 2% or 4%, uh, it doesn't really make much difference. Uh, so I would note that the regressions behind this, uh, these results include sort of the standard controls that are in typical Phillips curve models. We have uh, measures of long run inflation expectations and dynamic adjustment. We also have uh, the more flexible price effects coming through commodity prices, uh, imports, exchange rates. And we also find a global effects through global slack. This has uh, been Christian's focus in the past, which seem to be important. And so these global factors seem to operate, especially to the more flexible prices, uh, but they are important. But controlling for all these things doesn't change the, the fact that the Phillips curve is there. Uh, and it's just affected by the level of inflation, uh, as you see here. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so what does this mean in terms of the inflation we've seen in the pandemic? Uh, well, uh, in the uh, initial phase of the pandemic in 2020, the economy shut down around the world. Uh, and this put uh, severe downward pressure on all commodity prices around the world. This is a global phenomenon. And that led to most of the decline in inflation that you see there. Other prices basically didn't change too much uh, with the exception of some energy intensive services like uh, transportation. Um, then as we learned to live with COVID uh, and sort of people went back to work and demand sort of bounced back, uh, I would argue that demand actually came back more than supply. I, and I guess this is, uh, I'm agreeing with what uh, Jason was just talking about. Uh, and well, of course, also uh, the increase in output back towards its previous uh, trend uh, caused commodity prices to rebound, which uh, tells, which describes most of the increase in inflation for developing economies. But for advanced economies, we've got even more inflation. And that's, we believe, because we've moved to the steep part of the Phillips curve. We've actually uh, running economies above potential at least the short run potential, as Jason said. Now, and you might say, well, uh, unemployment today only ticked down to 3.9, which is about where it was pre-COVID. We didn't have inflation then. Why do we have inflation now? Well, I think um, as for some of the reasons Jason said and more, I think it's pretty clear that the natural rate of unemployment, and I don't, uh, by the way, I think that other measures, natural rate of unemployment, uh, the uh, unemployment rate isn't a sufficient statistic for inflation. So I agree with Jason, there's other things we should be looking at and, and they each have some power. But wh wherever you look at the natural rate of unemployment, uh, labor supply is definitely, um, natural rate of unemployment is definitely higher now. People are afraid of going to work. Uh, they don't want to get infected. They um, may have been shut out. Uh, their, their workplaces have been shut down temporarily. Uh, some parents have to stay home because kids are, uh, schools are closed. Uh, fiscal aid has helped people to afford to stay out of labor force. For all these reasons, uh, we think that uh, the natural rate on climate now is currently well above four. Uh, it may come back down to around four or so, or even less, um, but it's clearly above four and we're clearly on the steep part of the Phillips curve. Uh, and this is causing inflation. I would also add, and this is, uh, I think, a separate point, and I, this may be a a slight difference with what Jason said. I think the demand rotation away from services to goods has an additional effect of its own, even aside from the, the aggregate. Uh, because if you had linear Phillips curves, it wouldn't. Uh, the downward effect on services from reduced demand for services would lower prices there as much as the upward uh, demand for goods would raise prices there. But we don't have linear Phillips curves. We have nonlinear Phillips curves. And service prices don't fall much, but goods prices rise a lot. So your prices are much more flexible on the upward side. Therefore, a rotation in, in demand without changing the level of demand is inflationary, uh, even on its own. All right, the final slide. Um, so what does this mean going forward? Well, some people um, you know, see a return to the bad old 1970s. Uh, I think that uh, central banks, I think, are not going to make that mistake again. It took years of central bank uh, inaction and, and, and um, you know, being asleep at the wheel to, to, let, to lead to the 1970s. I don't think that's going to happen. The Fed clearly is signaling it's not going to happen. I think uh, the 1950s is a better uh, uh, analogy. And 
this chart is actually taken from a blog post I wrote back in February of last year when I uh, argued that there would be a big burst of inflation this year. Um, and for precisely the reasons Jason discussed, I mean, this massive fiscal stimulus using standard macro should raise inflation. And I, I couldn't, for the life of me, understand why no one was seeing that at the time, except for very few people, uh, what we saw. It. Um, and, but the thing is, will it be permanent? Well, it might be to the extent that output stays well above potential. Uh, and that's gonna be the key issue we should discuss. Uh, but in the 1950s, it came down very fast. Uh, what happened in 1950 was that South, North Korea invaded South Korea. Uh, the US went immediately into war, started drafting workers and buying goods. And households, remembering the rationing of World War II, uh, rushed to buy goods in, in advance of rationing, which was in, in fact not imposed. So there was a massive run up of inflation to almost 10% within just a few months. But it fell quickly within 12 months back to 2% and within 12 more months back to 1%. And this did not require a recession or any increase in the unemployment rate. And I think the key is that people saw this as a temporary thing related to the war. Also, uh, people, taxes were raised in the Korean War that probably the only time in US history where a war was fully financed by tax increases. Uh, and so that helped return uh, demand back to, to normal. So uh, given that people saw that this was just a, temp a unique thing and demand was pulled back in line, uh, inflation quickly fell uh, without causing recession. I think that could happen again if people think that COVID is a temporary phenomenon and that the COVID uh, pandemic and the reaction to it uh, caused this inflation, but that that won't continue, we could get back to something normal. Um, and I think we could get, if we get a rotation of demand back towards services away from goods uh, and workers are willing to go back to work to increase supply, supply could catch up with demand and, and we could get a rapid drop in price pressures, especially in goods. However, there's some uh, advanced signals that rents are about to rise, starting to rise. So that will go the other way. I, I, I'm not sure what's gonna happen in 2022, but I think that a year from now when all the dust is settled, I'm kind of with Jason. I think inflation is going to be lower than the 6% we just saw. But given that demand is likely to still be very strong and slightly ahead of supply capacity, I think inflation is still going to be well above the Fed's target of two. And something like 3% is, I think, certainly quite plausible. Um, if that's the case, my final point would be the Fed should really be raising the inflation target anyway. And that could be, in 2023, an ideal moment to do that, if that all pans out this way. Because if anything we've learned from the past 20 years is that 2% is too low of an inflation target anyway. Uh, it's too close to the zero bound for interest rates and for uh, wage and price behavior. And I'll stop there.